Right, so continuing where we left off before, we were talking about the four basic forces, and uh, this is going to be the last bit of information for forces in general before we get into circular motion. So here we are looking at friction, and so there's a little bit you need to write down from here. Friction is a force that is around us all the time that opposes relative motion between surfaces in contact. Uh, but it does sometimes allow you to move. It depends on the type of friction we're looking at within that. Um, some friction is what's keeping something from moving, and some friction is what is uh, maybe slowing down the motion, um, depending on which type of friction we're looking at. <coughs> so those two types of friction, again, the one that slows down the motion but still allows for motion to occur is called kinetic friction. And so if two surfaces are in contact and moving relative to one another, then the friction between them is kinetic friction. Um, but then if two objects are stationary, static friction can act between, act between them. Um, and then there's this last little bit here too that static friction is usually greater than kinetic friction between the surfaces. Um, <clears throat> it says usually, but that's really pretty much going to be the case throughout uh, what we're going to be looking at in this class. So static is greater than kinetic. <clears throat> so again, kinetic friction is the friction of motion, right? So um, if you think about it, whenever you're pushing something heavy across a, a floor, uh, it may take a little bit more energy to get it started and get it moving than it would once it's moving, right? Uh, and sometimes you even feel that little jolt as it starts to move and then it becomes easier to move, right? And that's because, again, static friction is greater than kinetic friction. So that static friction that's keeping it from moving is greater. And so if uh, you remember from our lab that we did about static and kinetic friction, uh, or if you weren't there, what we did was we pushed a, or pulled a block across the table and you could even visually see it on the graph that it did this build, 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 build up of static friction and then suddenly the force dropped significantly and then just flatlined whenever we moved it with constant velocity. That drop is when that static friction breaks and it starts to move and so that peak is this peak static friction And then the flat line part is kinetic friction. And that's at a constant velocity. So keeping this in mind, when we see the equations here in a minute for these two types of friction, remember static friction isn't just a, a number always. It's not a, the same number for every bit of force that's being applied to it. It can build up to that peak. So this just talks about how friction works when you zoom in super tight and look at what it looks like when you're looking at the two surfaces actually going against each other. And sometimes they're, depending on the roughness of the, the two surfaces or one of the surfaces, there will be um, bits and pieces of it that maybe break off and so I like to relate this to if you rub uh, sandpaper on a piece of wood, right? Um, piece, pieces and bits of the wood break off and make it smoother, right? The same thing applies to the sandpaper. The sandpaper also gets smoother as you use it and then you have to replace it and get a new piece of sandpaper to finish the job sometimes. So the same thing's happening in both cases <clears throat> bits of the surface are breaking off because of that friction and making those two things smoother in that case. So here you can kind of see that zoomed in shot of this crate being pushed against concrete. Uh, and you can see the little bits that are going to probably either break off or move up and down. Um, but those up and downward movements are going to be what causes that friction to occur, right? Whenever it catches on those little bits, that's the that's what we're feeling in terms of friction. <clears throat>
So, this one is a fun question here. Which method of sliding a block of ice requires less force? And looking at the picture, they're both using the same angle, same amount of force. Or at least it appears that way anyway. But which one's going to use the least amount of force of these two options, or are they the same? Or are they sh should they be equal forces? And really, if you think about it in terms of components, that top one, A, has a force that's going down and one that's going to the right. That downward force is going to push the two, the block of ice and against whatever surface it's on to where there's more friction making it harder to push it across whatever surface we're on. On the alternative side of that, B is lifting up and then to the right, which means that upward portion is going to actually lift it off of the surface a little bit and give us a little bit less friction to deal with, making it easier to move that block. So pulling actually is easier than pushing because you're not pushing whatever object you're moving into the surface that you're moving it across. So pulling at the angle above the horizontal is ideal. Now if they're horizontal, both of them are horizontal, then yeah, it, C is the correct one because they're the same. It doesn't matter if it's perfectly horizontal, but that's uh, not always the case and it's not easy to do that sometimes depending on uh, what object you're pushing or pulling. So here is the first of our two formulas. This is for magnitude of static friction. So the frictional force, the static friction, <clears throat> is less than or equal to the mu s. Mu s is the coefficient of static friction. That is a Greek letter, the Greek letter mu. And it's multiplied times our normal force, which remember is typically the weight Unless, of course, it is on an incline, <clears throat> then it is the, uh, regardless, it's the, the magnitude of the normal force is the force perpendicular to the surface of contact. So it may not be the opposite of the weight if we are on an incline. So do write down that formula as well. Don't forget that. Then we have kinetic friction. But here's the magnitude of kinetic friction. That is... A lot bolder than I thought it was going to be. There we go. But this one's an equals, right? So if you remember that graph that I drew, that sketch of the graph, it had that peak for the static friction, and then it flatlined for the kinetic. As long as we're moving at a constant velocity, it's going to be a flat line. So matching these key terms, friction, kinetic friction, and static friction. Friction, of course, is the force that opposes relative motion or attempts at motion between systems in contact. Kinetic is the one that's specifically opposing motion and when they are moving, and static friction is when they are not moving. Now, those, that mu, the coefficients of it, uh, that varies depending on what the two objects are, and typically there are, there are a lot of them that are known already. Um, sometimes you'll be looking to solve for that, but for the most part, a lot of them are known already. And we have tables built for just that situation. And here is one of them. So this one kind of is cut off at the bottom, but it's not a huge deal. Uh, but you can see all the different static friction coefficients and, and kinetic friction coefficients. And notice that the coefficients of kinetic friction are less than the st coefficients of static friction for every type of surface, every pairs of surface. Um, of course, the first two rubber on any kind of concrete, those are referencing tires on the road. Um, we've got wax wood on wet snow. People might wonder why we need that. Well, that's how you ski and snowboard. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, ice on ice, shoes on different things. Um, bone lubricated by synovial fluid. That's uh, in the joints of our, our body. So that's what helps to keep our, our joints lubricated. So these coefficients of friction, we kind of talk through some situations here. We're going to do an example problem here in a moment. So let's just go ahead and get to it. <clears throat> so again, here is that synovial fluid thing. Um, it's just the 
fluid that keeps our bones from grinding together, uh, which we don't want that, right? That's, that's not good. And we do have an image here on the next slide. There's a couple of knee joints. You can see on the top picture, the left one has a, uh, a repaired knee, surgically repaired knee, and the one on the right does not. Uh, the very bright white things usually are artificial, and that's what you're seeing there on that knee. And then on the bottom part, there's the knee bent. You can see the screws going into it as well. <clears throat> All right, so here we have this problem. Uh, we've, we've actually dealt with one very similar to this before. Uh, the same skier, actually, at the same angle and everything. They don't list out the angle here, but here's a picture showing us what's happening, and we've seen this before. But now we're dealing with the friction going on here, and we want to find what the coefficient of friction is depending on the situation. So let's see. Where. We want to find the coefficient of kinetic friction of the skier if friction is known to be 45 newtons, which we had before, and the skier's mass is 62 kilograms. Again, here's our picture, and we're looking at the <clears throat> components of the weight that are going to be acting against the skier as well. I'm going to redraw that picture here for us of our triangle. Skier up here. And again, we have the weight in that direction. That's the, we're going to call that the X direction. And we have the frictional force acting the other way. The actual weight is a 25 degree angle of the Y component of the weight. This is also a 25 degree angle. <clears throat> and of course our normal force going up the other way. So the things that are counteracting each other, normal force and the weight uh, in the Y direction. But again, really we're just focusing on what the coefficient of friction is. So Remember, FK is equal to mu k F N, which means we're really focusing on just what the normal force is. We're given the frictional force, so we don't need to do anything with that. And so our normal force is going to counteract the Y portion of the weight, which is the weight times cosine of 25 and our weights mg which we have both of those 62 is our mass and of course the weight or uh, gravity is 9.81 so once we solve this for mu k uh, that's what we're looking for. Fk, which we know, is 45 divided by this equation we just got, which I'm going to leave as mg cosine of theta in there. So, for our solution, 45 over 62 times 9.81 times cosine of 25. Again, remember, you do want to make sure that your calculator is in the right mode when you do this. I know my calculator is not showing up here, but uh, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to pull that up. But here we go. 0 0.082 is our answer. So here we are back with their work. You can, again, see the picture. And then what they did here, they did the, pretty much the same process. Took the, the weight. They, for some reason, used omega all of a sudden for it. But the weight of the skier, and that's equal to mg, they replace that, and that's equal to the normal force, and then replace that in the equation for kinetic friction, uh, which is exactly what we did, um, and then solved for mu k, 
by dividing by normal force on both sides. And so then plugging everything in, there's their work. And there's the same answer we got as well. Now there are some situations where there's the possibility that um, if something is has a net force of zero, so like the skier didn't have a net force of zero. She was skiing down the slope, had a, a force going, making her move down, um, and so that was counteracting the frictional force, but also more than that. So her net force wasn't zero. In this case, say there's a f force acting, or the weight of the skier is exactly the same as the, uh, or the, the X component of the weight of the skier perfectly counteracts the frictional force, and the Y ver version of that same for the normal force. Um, then this situation can happen where you can substitute some things in. Um, for one, our frictional force would be then equal to the weight uh, in the x direction specifically. Uh, so replacing that in there and also keeping in mind what we found earlier that the, the frictional force would be counteracted by the um, x component of the weight as well. So uh, there's both parts here, sine and cosine and all that. And it goes on then to say that we have this situation here where if you solve for mu k, you have mg sine of theta over mg cosine of theta. Which So the mg's are going to cancel. And then we, we talked about this briefly, but um, again, it's a, a trig thing that you'll see in pre-cal more than anything. That sine of theta over cosine theta, if you work out the opposite over hypotenuse over adjacent over hypotenuse, the hypotenuse is canceling it up with opposite over adjacent, which is tangent. So sine of theta over cosine of theta is equal to tangent theta, which means the mu k in these situations, whenever the net force is zero and there's an inclined plane, the frictional or the uh, coefficient of, of friction, mu k, is just tangent of the angle. Now we're going to leave it off of, off there. Uh, that's that's really all we need to get into when it comes to friction in terms of all of this. Um, the slides do go on into sub-microscopic and, and subatomic, but uh, we don't really need to get into that much here. So there we go.